Okay, welcome into Sports by the Book here at South Point Studios. We've got a fun show for you as we approach the Final Four in the men's NCAA tournament. We're taking a look at Elite Eight action in the women's side as well as NIT Final Four action. I'm Matt Neverett, joined today, as always, by my lovely partner, Alex White. At 3.30 here on the West Coast, our friend Arash Markazi joins us, the founder of the Sporting Tribune. We're talking both sides of the NCAA tournament. We'll slip in a little hockey as well at the end of the show as we've got a little bit of a break here, Alex, between the Elite Eight on the men's side and the Final Four. Uh, This is a very critical week for a lot of people to be able to handicap these games. I think for the players and for specific teams, though, this time off could be a a really tough week. Uh, Some teams are going to benefit from this more so than others, and I know I said that last week. There were two teams that I had in mind when I had brought that up last week. One of them, Clemson, gone. One of them, NC State, still in as an 11 seed. And this year's Cinderella in the NCAA tournament, obviously that's the team I've got in mind. Do you think that this time off affects this NC State magic run that they've been on? I do. I think this time it actually does. And I think that has more to do with the matchup that they have. I think Purdue is playing great basketball right now. I think the coach really figured it out on what they needed to make a deeper run in the tournament. We saw them get upset early on in the last few years, even with having the best college basketball player in Zach Eady. So he built this team around him, and they look really good. So I think it stops here for NC State, but that doesn't stop for you, does it, Matt? Because you have a winner, no matter what, with our, um, what are we calling it? Our March Mayhem Contest. There we go. Yeah, the March Mayhem Contest, and we'll bring in our director, Ann, on this one to kind of give an update. NC State, a... a, a you could bring your, your, your voice in, the, the, the voice, face, faceless voice. Well, there we go. We don't need Ann. We got, the, uh, we, we got the points up there. So Alex and Frank tied it with 112 points. No, I have 117. 117. Matt. There we go. Yep. 117 to 112. Glad my <laughs> eyes are working. Uh, Alex, just ahead of Frank, you guys each have one team remaining. And again, we did seed times round. So here in this matchup, it'll be critical for you to get that win to guarantee it, uh, even with a UConn win in these next two games for Frank. Uh, But none of those two anywhere close to where I am. NC State really taking it home with the win over Duke yesterday. Just about locking up this tournament for me. I've got two in the Final Four and two teams squaring off on Saturday in the Final Four. So I'm guaranteed at least one championship team. I hope for the sake of the tournament and for the uh, abundance of points that I've collected that we get another NC State victory. But yeah, looks like I'm going to take that one home. And I, I will say NC State, as I got them in the auction, I remember being not too pleased that I ended up with the 11 seed. I think I spent a little bit more than I would have liked to on them too, but I mean, not to mention they won five games in a row to win the ACC tournament. You were like, how much more does this team have? They're probably just happy to be in the NCAA tournament, but that is not true. They have a come from nowhere, but I would say um, ACC proving to be a very good basketball conference. I have to remember that moving forward. And I will let the record show. I did have Duke because I had a few four seeds. So if I would have won, well, I would have. If Duke would have won that yesterday over you. your your um, wolf pack there, then the, the points would have looked a little bit different. But got to give it to you. You are way ahead of us right now. We were actually watching the end of that game together after the Las Vegas Aviators contest that we were both working yesterday. I'm a little bit more humble today than I was yesterday at the, <laughs> at the restaurant. That was uh, Well, a, you, you had your brother there. I had to show off your, a little bit. Your good friend, Luke. And so, yeah, you, were, you guys were just like a little bit against me there. But had, that's okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> had to show off just a little bit, just a little bit. But guaranteed a little bit of money. Two teams uh, that are guaranteed to get it started for us on Saturday here in Final Four action. Uh, coming to you from State Farm Stadium in Phoenix, the home of the Arizona Cardinals, should be, uh, what, 80,000 almost in the house. They, they really, really pack these football venues to the brim when they play these basketball tournaments there, especially the Final Four. And for some reason, this, this stadium in Phoenix just seems to always do it right. We saw the Super Bowl there last year. Uh, we see the NCAA Final Four here this year. And uh, I don't know about you. I kind of like these basketball tournament games in the big-time football stadiums. Certain venues do it better than others. Phoenix is one that does it especially well. Have you been to one? I have not. Not in person. Um, but just watching on TV, just some of the cool things that they're able to do. It doesn't look like, you know, back in the day you had the, uh, the Toronto Raptors playing their first handful of games in a, a, a huge arena at, at, or north of the border before they were into their permanent digs. and. You just see some interesting sight lines. That's the biggest thing for me, though, is these sight lines, uh, the, the depth perception behind the basket for a lot of these players. We talk about it a lot kind of on the other side of the scale in these early season non-conference tournaments come November, December. But now we're in March, and it's expanded. I mean, you've got a football-sized stadium 
and a 94-foot basketball court going in the middle of it. I've been to one. I went to the Superdome in New Orleans when it was all the Blue Bloods. You remember that just a few years ago we had NC State um, beat Duke. We had Kansas and Villanova all in the Final Four. It's crazy. It, It... you can definitely tell that it has to affect the players with the depth. And for tickets, I mean, it it's rough. I know you just <laughs> want to be in there, but luckily I my dad was working with CBS Sports, so I got a media pass nice. just for the Final Four. I didn't go to the national championship, but I got to go down where and sit in the media section. That was great, but he was looking the night before for tickets, and he's like, uh, that's where you would have been if we didn't get you a media pass. And it was like... I mean, nosebleed, right? You can barely even see these teams. Yeah. But I will say they do do it really good for the student section. So it's a college thing, right? It's for the students. And all they they had the students up close and personal. So that was really cool to see. But, yeah, I mean, they fit as many people as they can in there. And it is a very good atmosphere. And we'll see who travels. All four of these teams east of the Mississippi. No team west of the Mississippi has won the title. I think I saw it almost 50 years. Just kind of a weird scheduling quirk. Uh, Obviously, way, way more teams uh, on the uh, on the East Coast per capita. But, yeah, we'll see who travels the best. I'll be very interested to see which team uh, has some great local support. Uh, the game that's going to get it started off, it's Saturday night, uh, 671-672, the betting rotation number, as the Crimson Tide of Alabama take on the number one overall team in the country in UConn. Uh, this game right now at 11.5 points, down to 11 at some places. And with a total of 161.5, they're expecting a lot of points in this game. This is the more, the more interesting matchup for me stylistically because you got this Alabama team that runs, runs, runs. They're high, high tempo, and they shoot a ton of threes. And then you've got this UConn team, really slow, really deliberate, really staunch defensively. They're going to have the defensive advantage. They've got a couple of bigs down low, including a couple of NBA lottery picks in the paint for the Huskies. That's going to be the biggest area for me where if UConn wins and dominates like they're supposed to, given the now 12-point point, point spread, that's going to be the area where they take over the most. Why have we not been talking about Donovan um, Klingon before this? He is outstanding. He had so many blocked shots against Illinois. I don't think um, UConn's going to have any trouble here, Matt, because we saw them just play a team with similar metrics to Alabama, right? Very good offensively, close to 100 in the country defensively, and we know that's been Alabama's struggle all along. I will say everybody's counting them out already. I mean, people have already are already looking at the lines and what it is, UConn versus Purdue or UConn versus NC State. Alabama's been sneaky good in this tournament. And people forget this is a team that was a one seed last year, one or two seed the year before. And now they're playing with house money, not as much pressure on their back this year. Four seed come in here. They've looked very good, been shooting very well as well in this tournament. So I think they might be able to hang in there for a little bit. But, I mean, we know this is – what, 10 straight games for the Huskies that they have covered the number yeah. and won by at least 13 points? It's been crazy. Over the last two years of the NCAA tournament, the 10-game the stretch that you were referring to, UConn has not only covered the spread in every game, they have covered every spread by eight or more points. They haven't just been beating teams. They have been running them out of the gym. And this year's iteration, though, a little bit differently because especially come the tournament, they have been stellar on defense. I mean, this is a UConn team that – can really score points. They run at a slow tempo, but they really are locked down defensively come this time of the year. Listen to these totals. They have not allowed an opponent to score over 58 points against them in this tournament. They allowed 52 to Stetson, 52 to San Diego State, 52 to the number one offense in the country in Illinois, and 58 to Northwestern. So not only have they scored a lot, defeated teams, dominated them, they have been stifling on defense. That 52 points allowed to Illinois is the one that stands out the most by far for me. Yes, yes and no, because, I mean, we saw them look fantastic. I thought they were a little bit fraudulent here, and their numbers have moved down again from being the number one offense back to the three. But we know they do have one of the best players in Terrence Shannon Jr. But, yeah, I just didn't see them hanging with them because they do what UConn does well, and then the Huskies just do it better, right? They didn't have anything to kind of contrast and push against them, which SDSU did because SDSU is top 10 defense. So they hung in there a little bit longer. They just didn't have uh, the firepower on the offensive side to keep up with them as well. I I don't know. Can you make a case for um, Alabama at all here? Yeah, because, I mean, in in two games in this tournament, including their Elite Eight win over Clemson, they scored over 54 points in one half. Okay, Uh, They scored 58 in the second half. Or, sorry, 54 in the second half against Clemson. 
58 in the second half of that opening round win against Charleston. So when they are, are given the opportunity, they score in bunches. They go off, especially in the second half, which is going to be the half to keep an eye on for them. And then we have in the emergence of Grant Nelson for them, who has been playing outstanding. It wasn't just a one-and-done game. We saw him look very good in that Clemson game as well. I don't know if he's quite as big. I mean, he's got the height to match up with some of these Huskies, but I don't know if he's got the size overall. So we'll see how this goes. But, yeah, I that total, I made it even a little bit higher than that, 163. Yeah. Not enough for me to want to play it over, but – We'll see how that tempo starts. Maybe it's a slower start. But then again, you already mentioned it. I mean, neutral site, new venue for both of them. I wouldn't be rushing to take the over here. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm conflicted on the, on the total itself. The Alabama runs the ninth fastest tempo in the country. UConn, 315th out of 362 teams at the Division I level. Uh, the thing that lends itself to an overplay for me, if I were to play it, uh, no action on this game as of yet, Listen to the three-point shooting outings for UConn in their last two games. Against Northwestern, 3 of 22 from beyond the arc. And against Illinois, who they beat by 25, they shot just 3 of 17 from downtown. So they have not played their best game, not taken their best shots, and are absolutely dominating these teams. And, you know, gun to my head right now, my play would be UConn and my play would be over. I got no action yet, but those are, those are leans early just based on what we've seen. UConn hasn't even been playing their best basketball on the offensive side, and they've gotten to this Final Four just absolutely dominating teams in the defense. That's what's so scary to me. You are right, and that is a great point that you make there. So we should see a um, little bit of a progression for them and maybe a little bit of a regression, though, for Alabama. That's what scares me with that total because True. they are coming off of 16 of 36 performance from deep against Clemson, and they also had 16 offensive rebounds. So I think we're going to see them regress a little bit here. But I don't know. I've got Alabama. I'm hoping that they can shock everybody and actually uh, take out the the Goliath here yeah. in UConn. Because it really is. I mean, this two-year run that the Huskies are on is as good as we've seen in college basketball since the last repeat champs, the Florida Gators in 2006 and 2007. Big difference was that Florida had a ton of lottery talent on that team. UConn, you know, they're not some down-and-out team that's just on a magical run. This is a, a dominant blue blood in, in college basketball with some real talent, and as I had mentioned, a couple of NBA lottery picks, but a lot of it has come down to Dan Hurley and the way that he's coached, the way that he's motivated, because when you look at the numbers from last year, UConn finished third in adjusted offense and ninth in adjusted defense on Ken Palm. This year, they're first in adjusted offense and fourth in adjusted defense with maybe a worse team on paper. It's very impressive. It has to be because... Um... The eight M and M seeds before it's the eight M and M's. Yeah, yeah. What was the what was the story it. with that? It's just a weird superstition he has. <laughs> I just like to see eight, eight M and M's before every game, but they cannot be of the color of the opponent. So, say he's playing a team of red, he will toss that one out, get a new one, have his eight total M and M's. I wonder how you settle on eight exactly. You know, you it's got to be you, a lucky number. You start right? with six, you lose the game. You go up to seven, you lose the game. All right, that third game they they won with eight, although they haven't lost more than one game in a row all year. Uh, that one uh, should True. be a great opening game to start. The other one, I don't know how to feel about this one. I, I have more of a feel on this UConn and uh, an Alabama game, but six seven three six seven four in the betting rotation. NC State against Purdue. You got the 11 seed Cinderella with DJ Burns and company making this magic run uh, against Purdue, who has you know it's funny to say defied all odds for a team that's been a number one seed three the last four years, but. They still have a chance to lose to a double-digit seed, Alex, and that's what they have uh, have Ooh. made their notoriety for doing here over the last couple of years. This one at nine and a half, Purdue, a big-time favorite, with a total at one forty-six, and that nine and a half, very uh, something that you're gonna have to keep it on. Critical here for the spread. There has never been a Final Four where both games have had a double-digit point spread. In fact, there's only been one double-digit spread in a Final Four game in the last fifty years. Alex, we are a hook away from having two. In this one, you said you liked the dog in the other side with Alabama catching double-digit points. What about your thoughts on NC State here, almost laying 10? Not necessarily like the dog enough to take it because I did make that number right there at 12 and a half. So I'm not a play for me on Alabama, just rooting for them. And I remember I do still have – that's my last future Man. alive. So I will have to bet – You're rooting for them UConn. in other ways, yeah. I will have to bet UConn to hedge that one a little bit. But this one I do like Purdue. I made them a, about 11 and a half, 12-point favorite here over NC State. And I'm with you. I was on Duke this past weekend thinking that they would get it done. NC State, we'd see um, a little bit of a regression, the time off. The rest, they needed the momentum, but I do think this is the stopping point for them, and Purdue is on a run. Like I said, Matt Painter, the coach for Purdue, credit to him for what he has done and built this team. 
not no longer the number one three-point shooting team in the country now, but Purdue is still the number two. So what they do is outstanding with Zach Eady on the boards and then having their guards out deep. So I think they'll be okay in this one. This is a weird matchup to look at on Ken Palm. You got Purdue's third in Ken Palm, second in adjusted offense, 16th in adjusted defense, and then NC State just about middle of the pack as far as not only tournament teams, but teams in the country in just about every metric. 43rd in Ken Palm, 40th in adjusted offense, 45th in adjusted defense. They're smack dab in the middle of the country with 144th in terms of 362 teams in tempo. This is just a team and a side that it has found ways to win games, and they've done it uh, really with their backs up against the wall. I, the graphic and the, the video started to go around on social media last night about just how close they were to not making the NCAA tournament, let alone make it out of the semifinals of the ACC tournament. This is a team that was down at half to Louisville, who fired their coach in the quarterfinal game, came back to win that one. They were down with 8.3 seconds left by three against Virginia in the semifinal game. That's right. Uh, I forget the name of the kid, but he missed his second free throw in a row up three. Kid had not missed two free throws in one trip the entire year. And they went down and drained a three as time expired, won it in overtime, and they have not lost since. Winners of nine in a row are the NC State Wolfpack. And by doing so, have you seen the bonuses that head coach Kevin Keats has been has been clearing up? Yeah, pretty good, especially because wasn't he kind of on the hot seat? He was going to get fired. He was a free throw this. make away from being fired. <laughs> Listen to these bonuses that he's amassed since then. For winning the ACC tournament, not only did he get a $400,000 raise and a $110,000 bonus, he got a two-year extension onto his contract. Then they go into the NCAA tournament. He makes twenty five dollars for the first round win, fifty dollars for wins in the th- round of 32, the Sweet 16 in the Elite Eight, and a $100,000 bonus for the win in the Elite Eight. I-, I don't know what the contract states for a win in the Final Four. You would have to assume at least another $100,000 raise, right? Kevin Keats, honestly, the money man. Honestly, it's pretty impressive, and I would say that it is well-deserved here because, I mean, he took down some pretty good teams to get to this spot, and even to win the ACC tournament that is a, such a good conference is very impressive in itself. So, yeah. They call it March Madness. It's money madness for, uh, for, for Kevin Keats and NC State. The, the narrative around DJ Burns is an interesting one for me. Because he's redshirted his freshman year at Tennessee, he spent three pretty dominant years at Winthrop in the Big South, and then is playing out his final two years of eligibility with <laughs> NC State. I saw somebody on, on Twitter point out, they said, people are treating DJ Burns like this is this, this great story, and he's some make-a-wish kid that just all of a sudden is big <laughs> and learned how to play basketball. He was the number three ranked recruit in the state of South Carolina wow. in his graduating year. You know the two guys ahead of him? Who? Both in the NBA. Zion Williamson and Aaron Naismith. Wow. He was the the only player. If those two didn't exist, he would have been the number one player out of South Carolina in his high school graduating class. So, yeah, he's not not some make-a-wish kid that got big and figured out how to play basketball. This has been a dominant big man for a long time. And NC State trying to go down low in this matchup. They're going to run into some trouble with Zach Eady defending DJ Burns. Absolutely. And we saw that with Tennessee there in uh, Dalton Connect having to go up against Zach Eady, but it's been the story of both the DJs, right? DJ Bird and DJ Horn there for NC State. But I will say a lot of people were talking about Duke getting lucky in that South region and how, you know, the seed numbers that they ended up playing, right? I think it was a 12 and then a 13. Yep, because of the upset. I think uh, NC State got a little bit lucky too. And I think that that win was more about Duke who was lucky to beat Houston. They mm-hmm. took down Houston for NC State because of the injury. And then, I mean, they still didn't look great in that second half. And we, no, we should have thought about that. Did. Yeah. And known that Duke was a little bit fraudulent here and kind of lucky. But I don't know. We'll see. I mean, it is a great story. Happy for NC State players. And it's awesome that they have their women's in the Final Four as yeah. well. So great for their school. But I really think Purdue has been has had this on their mind. They're going to the championship game and, and focus. I think they can cover this number. NC State dominant right now. Winners of nine in a row coming back from death's door. They're also 4-0 and this year, ATS, when they're an underdog of nine points or more. So in this situation, they have covered every time this year. Although I don't think they've taken on the level of competition uh, that they will see in Purdue and especially Zach Eady down low. Your thoughts on the total, 146. I thought it was a bit low. These are two pretty good defensive teams overall. There's going to be a lot of free throws in this game. Any game with Zach Eady will have a ton of free throws. A couple of numbers that I found. Purdue has gone over 146 24 times out of 37 games this year. So 24 and 13 to the over to that number. And for NC State, it has been 25 times out of 40 games. 25 and 15 
that they have gone over 146. And this 146 point spread or total, I should say, is 6.8 fewer points per game than the average of produced totals on the year. So I, I think this number is low. Where, what did you make this number? I actually made it 143 here. Mm. So leaned a little bit to the under. But you know what is is funny is I saw those numbers and those trends with NC State and that Duke game because I made that one a little bit lower too. But that definitely stayed under the total. It got a little bit scary at the end there. But so I think now, Matt, that we're getting down to these big crucial games, you're going to see a more of a defensive effort from both sides. So I don't know though. I mean, that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty normal college basketball total. Definitely. I mean, these well, are two teams. Way. Two teams also kind of middle of the pack in terms of tempo. NC State. 144th, you got Purdue at 205th. That's a little bit slow, but nothing crazy. A lot of it because they run so much of their offense uh, through Zach Eady, who, by the way, in this game, will likely break the all-time record for most free throws attempted, or f- sorry, field goals attempted in one college basketball season. Part of the, partly because of the way that he plays, partly because they've made this run and have played the extra games, but come halftime or so, okay. Zach Eady, I think it's five shots away from setting the all-time field goal attempt record in an NCAA season. Not surprising, though. It's seven foot four. Right. I mean, it, it, it is a little expected there. What's more surprising is the freshman that is about to be a record tonight in Juju Watkins for USC. Yeah, we'll talk about the women's Elite Eight mm-hmm. matchups here in, a, in a, about 10 minutes or so with Arash Markazi yes. of the Sporting Tribune. Uh, but again, first time in 50 years that there has been one double-digit spread in the Final Four. We are approaching, we are a half a point away from the first time ever with two double-digit spreads in Final for action as we take a look now before we wrap up this discussion on the odds to win the championship overall and a couple of exactas that we think are are really worth taking a look at right now and these numbers brought to us by Chris Andrews the sportsbook director here at South Point right before we took the air so these are about as updated as they get uh UConn minus 240 Purdue plus 240 you got Alabama at 18 to 1 and NC State at 25 to 1 and NC State was 200 to 1 uh, before the tournament they're looking to become the fourth team since 2007 to win the big dance with pre-tournament odds of greater than 15 to 1. The other three, UConn, thrice. So this is going to be really unprecedented if UConn, or if NC State, beg your pardon, is able to uh, do what they want and win two more games. Well, Alabama was greater than 15 to 1 They're as the well, other one, so yeah, so 30 do. to 1 on them. So, I mean, yeah. we got a 25% chance of somebody other than UConn winning with greater odds than, than 15 to 1 pre-flop. Um, is I there... would feel better if uh, UConn and Purdue were playing each other exactly. in the final four. Then... Is there a, is there a world where you can see Alabama? If, if if Alabama beats UConn, they obviously have a shot against anybody. Is that eighteen to one enticing enough for you on the on the Crimson Tide? No, I, you know I already have one, so doubling down, absolutely not. But Fair, I totally forgot about yes. that. Uh, we were talking about Purdue, but really, I mean, I don't, I don't, I think they will literally shock the world if they beat UConn here first, absolutely. and then I think they will celebrate and be so excited about that. That the other side will probably take them <laughs> down. That's usually how it goes in these games, right? Yeah. Um, we were talking about some exactas. There yes. was a, one or two that stood out. Um, and the, the ones that, that caught my eye, the, the two that I think are the most likely to happen involve UConn and Purdue. I think that those are the two teams that will get to it, uh, point spread or otherwise. I think those are the, the two winners of these games, however you want to bet it. Right now, UConn to beat Purdue in the championship is minus 130. No interest in that. The one that I'm looking at, 5268 here at South Point, Purdue over UConn is actually up to plus 375 now. Just right before we took the air, it was up to plus 375. And that's the one that I was keeping an eye on because just looking at the numbers, Purdue right now, just about minus 450 on the on the money line, a big-time favorite against NC State. And based off your numbers that we had talked about pre-flop, Alex, we're assuming Purdue, if they win and UConn wins, would be about a plus 150, 160 dog. Uh, you parlay those two together, theoretically, it, it takes you about – plus 260, plus 275. You're getting almost a full dollar better per dollar uh, on your bet if you take that Purdue over UConn exacta. For my money, if I'm going to bet anything that we had just discussed, it is that exacta of Purdue over UConn. I guess unless UConn does blow out Alabama as well and Purdue barely skates by here, so then it's a bigger number. You might pass on that first bet and just take them in the championship. But I'm with you. I like this. I think that is a very intriguing bet here at plus 375. And what's interesting is, you know, it's called bookmaking, but it opened that certain number. That means money's probably coming on UConn. They're making it more enticing for us. But I honestly believe Purdue has a shot yeah, absolutely. To, to beat UConn. So I do think that that is probably the best bet in those exactas. And Chrissy wanted to remind us to, to tell the folks at home, 
They don't just move the numbers down. Sometimes they will go in your favor as well. I We were talking about that one. It was at 7 to 2, plus 350. He comes in and goes, oh, it's plus 375. I said, oh, yeah, move with me. He goes, yeah, remind them on the air that we don't just move numbers down. We also move them up, too, depending on the action. You'll, well, the- you'll find that here more at South Point, way more than a lot of other big books. That's true, right? They kind of just leave it there, let it settle there. But, yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, Alabama opened, when they reopened this, 15 to 1. Now it is 18 to 1. So that should tell you all you need to know about their two uh, tough games ahead of them if they were to beat UConn and then their next one. So, but, yeah, I think that's the only one I would actually look at with Exacta because, I mean, I would like to see some plus money. If that was even money, UConn beating Purdue. done deal. Yeah, that would be very, very enticing. But still, they are so dominant right now that you even have to lay it, and they have to win two games. <laughs> Crazy, yeah. Two-leg money line parlay at minus odds. Yeah, that just you don't see that often. You've seen it over these last two years with UConn. Again, they have not only covered every spread in the tournament, both last year and this year, looking to repeat, they have done it by eight or more points in every game. Uh, I think that they do that in this first or in this final four. We'll see about a potential championship. Yeah, it's tough, especially... You think uh, that first half, you think that each team that we've seen so far, oh, maybe they can hang around, and then they just uh, run away with it in that second half. We'll see what we got. Still plenty of time to break these games down. Uh, not until Saturday. I am not a fan, a fan as a fan of these long extended layoffs, but hey, what are you going to do? you gotta give, got to give the guys a rest sometime, right? People forget, these guys have been playing since the end of October. That's when the college basketball right. season really gets going with some of the early season tournaments. Uh, so it, it is a long, long season to play 40-plus games in the NCAA. About five minutes away from bringing in our guy, Arash Markazi, of the Sporting Tribune, Las Vegas and L.A. local. But want to br- talk about a couple of the games that we're going to bring up with him on the women's side of the tournament in the Elite Eight. And uh, the, these Elite Eight games, uh, you know, you've, if you don't know the rest of the tournament, you would think that these were Final Four matchups, the games that are, uh, that are going on tonight um, at the MVP Arena in Albany and the Moda Center in Portland. Um, on the women's side, LSU Iowa in a matchup of last year's championship and Connecticut USC. We'll, we'll talk about both of these games with Arash here in just a couple of minutes. Is there one of these games in particular that, that you've got your eye on? Because these are going to break viewership records for for the women's side because they are really really intriguing and there's a lot of great storylines to pick from. And honestly, I just want to watch them tonight and enjoy them and not have any money on either one. That's a rarity um, for you. It is actually <laughs> right. But yeah, I then maybe maybe I'll have some bets when we get down to the final four. But for tonight, they're two great matchups. A lot of stars on. I mean, in all four, really yeah. on all four teams. So I think it'll it'll be great. And that rematch of last year's title game. I'm looking forward to that one. And that one takes off right when we get off the air at four o'clock. So you can go right from us to watching Andrew Reese and Caitlin Clark do battle. Also at six o'clock, UConn takes on USC and. Uh, Paige Bukers, Juju Watkins, that is going to be just a matchup to watch and see who can dominate who. I'll be really excited to see, after the fact, some of the viewership records that are broken because I can guarantee you that this will be the most night, most watched night of women's college basketball ever, and we're just in the Elite Eight. I, I 100% agree, Matt. Well, we were talking about it on Punchlines, too. It, yeah. it has to be the most watched Did, did Frank bet one or two overs on, the, on these games yet? He, I, he didn't talk about it. He's rooting for Iowa, though, which, I mean, they have the revenge. They're the favorite. I was kind of surprised about that. I kind of was, too. I kind of was, too. We'll talk about the numbers. We'll talk about these matchups here in two minutes. We'll step aside. 120-second break. When we return, our guy Arash Markazi joins from the Sporting Tribune. We're talking NCAA tournament on both the men's and women's sides. Stick around. This is Sports by the Book. Back in a moment. South Point offers all the types of entertainment you'd expect at a first-class Las Vegas resort. Did you know our 400-seat showroom is one of Las Vegas' top destinations for live entertainment? Enjoy live performances by classic Vegas entertainers, bands, and today's hottest comedians, plus a rock and dance floor. You can also enjoy live entertainment at the Grand View Lounge, where you'll feel all the vibes of old Las Vegas. Enjoy the music, and if you love to laugh, don't miss The Dirty at 1230, our very own free comedy show, every Friday night at 12.30 a.m. in the Grand View Lounge. The Dirty is 100% free, so arrive early. Go to southpointcasino.com or call the box office at 77136 for today's performances at the showroom and the Grand View Lounge. When you're ready for your favorite cocktail, stop in and unwind at one of our seven specialty lounges. There's a bar around every corner, because you're in Vegas, baby. South Point Casino has plenty of attractions for the whole family. 
Catch a movie. Our 16-screen movie theater includes two XD extreme screens for the ultimate in viewing, sound, and luxury. After the show, treat the family to a variety of treats at our old-fashioned ice cream parlor, Kate's Corner. We scoop up a variety of creamy concoctions, including smoothies, hand-dipped cones, milkshakes, malts, sodas, and sundaes. At Kate's, there's something for everyone. And if you've still got time to spare, our bowling center might be right up your alley. Voted Best of Las Vegas, it's a great place for friends and family fun. 64 lanes, a pro shop, snack bar, and arcade. And while the kids are bowling, you can play slots and sip on a drink in the Alley Cat Lounge while overlooking the lanes. For our more serious and professional bowlers, the South Point is also home to a separate tournament bowling plaza. Hey there, welcome back. This is Sports by the Book from the South Point Studio. She's Alex White. I'm Matt and Everett. Be sure to leave your live comments as well. We always love seeing your live comments about some of your thoughts on the men's Final Four action. And now as we transition over to Elite Eight action on the women's side, Alex, I mentioned that these games likely to break viewership records. This show likely to break viewership records on this episode because we've got Arash Markazi, founder and CEO of the Sporting <laughs> Tribune, former writer for the LA Times and a friend of the program. Arash, thanks so much for joining us from Southern California. You are a big USC women's basketball fan. What has yeah. it been like to watch Juju Watkins and the true freshman season that she has had because she is doing things in the modern age that have been unprecedented for a true freshman? She's been so incredible. You know, I went to USC during the time period. They had Matt Leinert and Reggie Bush and Pete Carroll. And what Juju Watkins has done with that program, I mean, when you look at the young girls and the young fans who really go to these games, and, the, and by the way, the celebrities who during the course of the season have shown up to the Galen Center to watch USC this season, I think everyone's very excited to see what USC does. Again, you, you, you have to realize, you know, this, um, you know, college year began with a lot of talk about about Caleb Williams and the football team. They didn't do that well. Bronny James, it's an Isaiah Collier with the men's basketball team. They didn't do that well. Juju Watkins has really lived up to the hype at USC as they're having their best season since Lisa Leslie was there. And again, if they find a way to win tonight and beat Paige Buckets <laughs> and <laughs> UConn, really to do something that they haven't done uh, to go back to the Final Four, which you know they, they uh, went to with Cheryl Miller and Cynthia Cooper back in the day. So it's just a fun time here. It is going to be a tough one, but Vegas is telling you pretty close as well. UConn just yeah. a three and a half point favorite. What is USC going to have to do to win this one? You know what? They are a very deep team. Again, there's a lot of talk about Juju as well. But when you look at the way that they won the uh, Pac-12 championship against Stanford and she did not have a big night. So I would look for, you know, the entire team to play well. It's going to be a tough game. You know, the game that they had against Baylor was a tough game. So, you know, listen, when you get to this point in the season, if they are to find a way to advance and pull the, the upset, uh, you know, it, it, it grinded out a uh, game. But they're a very good defensive team as well. So, um, listen, I mean, obviously I'm going to go with USC, but, uh, <laughs> but it's going to be a very good game. Hey, you mentioned that game against Baylor. Juju Watkins, just 8 of 28 shooting. But because yeah. of her proclivity to get to the free throw line, she averages over 8 free throws a game, which is best in the country. She still finished with, with 30 points. Uh, just finding a way to get to the bucket, Juju Watkins. Although she'll be matched up in this game tonight by another player who finds a way to get points. You, you called her Paige Buckets, Paige Bukers, uh, <laughs> averaging right. over 27 points per game in the postseason. And with the way that she plays, this UConn team is really running well. It's interesting, though, Arash, two teams getting to this point, very different styles. You mentioned USC, pretty deep. They rely a lot on Juju Watkins, but not entirely. And they won the Pac-12 tournament, which is as deep and as talented as it gets on the women's side. Meanwhile, UConn, they run about six deep. They have a very thin rotation. They're very star-studded and top-heavy in that six-player rotation. But they also ran through a pretty lowly Big East top to bottom, winning it as they usually do relatively easily. Do you think that the harder road that the Trojans have had to take to get to this point is going to aid them in a big-time game like we'll see? 
I really do think so, and I, I think that the way that they really progressed during the course of the season, I mean, they they have been a very good team all year, but they really improved as the season has progressed. And Lindsey Gottlieb, the head coach of this team, has done a great job of really stressing t- to them that, listen, at the end of the day, if the shots aren't falling, you're going to win these games on the defensive side of the ball. So, um, listen, I, I, I do expect it to be a very good game, a very close game, uh, but when you look at you. USC. I mean, I did not think that they would be here at this point. Sometimes it's hard to forget Juju Watkins is a true freshman, uh, but she certainly has not looked that way this season, certainly as we've progressed in this year and also during these, this um, NCAA t- tournament run. Well, I know Jeff Parles is a big believer. He has a future bet on USC, so he's nice. hoping that he could get it. He got that early, done. yeah. He did. He's, <laughs> he's liked them a lot all year. I want to ask you about the total here sitting at 135. Do you have a lean over or under that you would look? I think it'll be a little bit under, so I'm going to go with the under. I think it'll be a low-scoring game. It'll be a defensive game. Um, you know, listen, I mean, obviously that could totally change if Juju Watkins plays well. I mean, I, I do think it's important to note that USC, to your point, Matt, is, is, has find has really found a way to win games this season when Juju Watkins has not played particularly well. So it's a really a testament to, to this team and how deep that, that they are. Yeah, Juju Watkins having one of the best true freshman seasons in NCAA women's basketball history, and then, of course, going against the Blue Blood of all Blue Bloods here in the Elite Eight. That game uh, tipping off just after six here on the West Coast with USC uh, catching three points. But we'll move it to the other game, and this is going to be the one that more people likely will watch, a rematch of last year's championship game between LSU and Iowa. It was a 102-85 to win for LSU last year. But this year's team looks a little bit different. They lost three 20-point scores from that game alone to transfer or graduation. Uh, Is this year's LSU team, in your eyes, Arash, as similar to last year's team in the sense of just being able to dominate at the highest level this late into the tournament? You know, they're not as good as last year's team, but they do have that chip on their shoulder. And you saw, you know, what they uh, did during that UCLA game and then the way that they really came in together, you know, whether it was the Washington Post story or the Times column, they, they, they really found a way to really kind of, and by the way, and sometimes when you are that good and you're the defending champions, it's hard to have a chip on your shoulders. And sometimes yeah. you have to cr- create that chip. <laughs> they, they haven't had to create that chip. I mean, it has been there uh, for them. And you brought up a really great point in the previous segment and during the show. I mean, last year's championship game did 9.9 million like almost 10 million just to put that into context i mean that is more than uh you know the the, uh, conference final sometimes i mean you go to christmas day the lakers celtics game did like a 2.9 million or something like that so so the like interest level to see this game you're 100 right and back-to-back games it'll be the most watched nights night in women's college basketball history Love that. Just setting records here. Now, we've seen it a lot on the men's side, this contrast of styles. I wouldn't say it's as extreme here, but Iowa, so good offensively, not great defensively. And then on the flip side, LSU, so good defensively, of course, with Angel Reese. And then they have the height there. Which one do you think prevails today? I like Louisiana State. Again, I mean, it's been such an amazing run for Caitlin Clark and Daiwa. And again, I think if you're a, a TV programmer, if you're one of the networks, I think you want Caitlin Clark to continue. But uh, I, 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 just, I just don't think that the team has been that uh, like as great as I thought this season. So I'm going to go Louisiana State. Again, I, I think these will be two great games, fantastic games that will go down to the, the end of the wire. Uh, but give me Louisiana State in this one. Yeah, this game just feels like LSU for me. I, I think it's going to take a miraculous outing out of Caitlin Clark to be able to defeat the size, the depth, the rebounding acumen that this LSU team uh, has put up there all year. Number that I found on this game that really kind of swung me to that one, LSU averages – 46 rebounds per game, which is really wow. high in the women's game. Iowa this state is 28 and one when holding opponents to under 40 rebounds. They're just four and four when opponents grab 40 or more. But how about when LSU grabs 40 or more rebounds? They're 27 and one this year. Their only loss to the Gamecocks of South Carolina. So the, the boards, I think, are going to be the deciding factor for me. The thing is, though, is if Iowa makes their shots, if they right. just go off and shoot like 50% from three, there's not going to be many boards to have. So I think that that. Plus, finding a way around that 2-3 defense that Iowa runs the majority of the time going to be the, the key factors for LSU. And, 
Arash, last thing on this game, Flo J. Johnson. She's been great. She's last year's freshman of the year nationally. She's averaging almost 20 points a game on 61% shooting from the field over the last seven games. Her and Paige Buchers have been the best two players in this tournament, bar none. Uh, is it going to take a big game from Flo J, or is there enough going on elsewhere for this LSU team where they're going to be able to pull out a win, even if she doesn't live up to those numbers that she's been putting up? My guess is she will have to have a big game for them to win. But you brought up a, a great point. In these two games, there are four transcendent players, I believe, and certainly led by Caitlin Clark, that if they go off, I mean, forget about everything that we said. I mean, you know, if, if Caitlin Clark has a big night, if Flo J, if uh, Paige Bukers, if Juju Watkins, again, if they're in their groove, and again, we've seen all four players have nights like this. I, I go back to Juju Watkins' 51-point uh, night against Stanford. Again, so, you know, like, like once the ball's tipped off and they're in the zone, uh, like all bets are off for lack of a better <laughs> a phrase there. So, uh, listen, as much as I like Louisiana State in this game, if we start watching in that first quarter, if Caitlin Clark's having one of those nights, again, which is why people tune in to see her do what she does best. Uh, this could be a, a, a night that, again, that, that this is why we tune in to these games. These four players in particular are going to be huge. Yeah, the, the storylines abound in these games. And as you had said, Arash, going to break viewership records, this is going to be the most viewed night of women's college basketball ever. Uh, flipping it over to the men's side, I want to get a couple quick thoughts from you on some of these men's final four matchups. Again, joined here on Sports by the Book by Arash Markazi of the Sporting Tribune. Uh, covers the teams in Las Vegas. L.A. and Hawaii, all four of the teams that are in the men's Final Four are from east of the Mississippi. We were talking <laughs> earlier, we're going to see who travels well. We'll see which athletic department has the budget to, to fly students or which students have the, uh, the budget to fly themselves out on their own. I uh, want to start with Alabama-Connecticut because this game, contrasting styles. Alabama, the ninth fastest tempo in the country. Uh, Connecticut, a bottom 50 team in terms of tempo. But for Alabama, the defensive struggles are going to be the key in this one. Connecticut is as efficient as it gets in the country. They are as well coached as it gets in the country. They are the big-time favorite. Do you think that UConn not only wins this game but dominates? Because as we've said a bunch of times on this show, they have not only won and covered in every tournament game over the last two years, they've done it by eight or more points above the spread. UConn at a 12-point favorite. Basically, the question that I'm posing, do you think they win by 20 or more? <laughs> I think they cover the spread. I have never seen a team like this. Again, I, I got to cover UConn last year during the West Regional that was played in Las Vegas, and they blew out those games, and I covered them in the Final Four in Houston. They blew out those, those games. And again, the teams that they've, they've been this year on their journey to get back to, to the Final Four, these are very good teams, and they've blown them out. And they did something, and you guys have talk, talked about it, or you will talk, the 30-0 to run. In yeah. all my years of calling – covering basketball that is an absurd number especially when you get to this state of the basketball where you talk about the top eight teams in the country to go on a 30 to zero run i mean there's no reason that game should have been a blowout of course it was so i expect you kind of win by 20 so the fact that the line is 12 is again crazy for a final four game but it's not when you look at what uconn has done and what dan hurley has done with that program again i expect them to repeat um hopefully Hopefully the championship game is close, but uh, by the way, I covered the Alabama this weekend in Los Angeles, and what an amazing story there for them to like even get to this point. So that they're happy to be there. Uh, they're they're really trying their best. To your point, to get some of their <laughs> students to come out to that game. It is a football school. You can't yeah. get more of a football school than that. They're basically saying, "Hey, if you got to drive, if you got to, uh, we can help you pay for your plane ticket. Come out to watch these guys play." But I think it'll be a short run for them. Yeah, right. that, I was calling a baseball game during that uh, that UConn Illinois oh, yeah. or that 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 thirty to nothing run, and I remember checking the score at the half and being like, <laughs> "Oh, great, close game." And then I remember checking it. You know, about 15, 20, 30 minutes later, oh, my God. The Big Ten champion. Yeah. That was against, and it, they were the number one <laughs> offense. That's, that is just incredible. So, to your point, yes, this hasn't just been teams that snuck in in uh, smaller conferences. I mean, these are big, good basketball schools that they have 
they have beaten here. And now I want to ask you about the total sitting here at 161 and a half because Alabama plays fast and we've seen them do very well. You just covered them. Their threes have been going in, but UConn has been holding teams to 50 to 55 points yeah, they've here. They've 52, 52, 52, and 58 in their four tournament wins so far. What do you what do you think about this total? Is that too high? I mean, UConn is 5-0 and to the under. Yeah, it's a little high, but you are right. They This is a team, the Crimson Tide, they live and die by the three, and their coach, Nate Oates, I mean, really stresses that. I mean, if you don't shoot the ball, I'm taking you out of the game. And so the players love that. They love that they're not going to get pulled if uh, they miss. They're going to get pulled if they don't attempt. Yeah. And so um, this is a style that, that has really worked for them. Nate Oates has really perfected the style, and it's obviously taken them – to this point that that said, UConn is just such a fantastic defensive team that I can't imagine that this will be a high scoring game. As I said, I think it'll be a blowout. So um, I don't think it'll be the over take the under in this one. And Arash, I want to get your quick thoughts on Purdue NC state one yeah. seed versus the 11 seed. I, personally, I think that the magic run for NC state stops for the sake of our contest yeah. that we have um, internally, Arash, where I've got NC State as an 11 seed and Purdue as a one seed. I'm getting a team into the championship one way or another, but I, I think that this is a, a Purdue blowout. I think that while the other game has a chance to be a blowout, I think that this Purdue team has a chance to really run away. I don't think they're going to have any answers for Zach Eady down low. What say you? I agree with that. I, I think this has uh, been an amazing run for uh, Purdue, and I get why uh, people kind of knocked them or didn't predict them uh, to go far after the way that they obviously got the upset a year ago. This is a different team. And when we talk about chips on shoulders, that is what Purdue has. That is what Zach Eady has. Uh, it is very rare to have a one seed and the best player in the country get knocked the way that they have uh, done. Uh, so I do expect them to win. I don't know if it'll be a blowout, but I do expect them to win. And by the way, an amazing run by North Carolina State to like even get uh, this far. Uh, but yes, give me Purdue in this one. I believe that you are traveling this weekend, and it was a lot of fun. We got to see you two weeks ago. You were here, yes. and you came to the South Point for those first few days, the round one and two. How was that experience, and did you do it last year as well? And then what are you looking forward to this weekend? You'll be uh, there at the Final Four. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, I love I love going to the final four. It's unique in terms of the tournament and that I've said this for many, many years. It is the only sports event that is more exciting at the beginning than it is at the finale. When you think <laughs> of all the amazing sports, you, you would never say the first round is the most fun. That's not the case. And again, it, 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 it's the only sports event. And I've been so blessed in my career to uh, travel. It's the only event. You can't take me out of Las Vegas. Las Vegas <laughs> and the South Point in particular is the best place be because you got all these games happening on uh, TV, and I took a picture of uh, the food and the drink and the uh, prices at the South Point. And I'm not just saying this; I mean, it, you can't beat that. So, uh, mm -hmm. listen, I will always be in Las Vegas for that first weekend because you don't know where the best place to go. Now, once we get down to the regional, once once we get down to the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight, the Final Four championship game. That's when I would like to be there in person. But that first weekend, that first round in particular, no better place to be than Las Vegas and in the South Point in particular. That's why we like having you on the show. Other reasons <laughs> right. as well. Um, Arash Markazi of the Sporting <laughs> Tribune. Hey, before we let you go, Arash, wanted to bring up the article that you had published today about the Tropicana <laughs> and, and everything going on with that. Tell us a little bit about the research that went into that article and kind of what your findings were. Yeah, listen, I mean, so I stayed there one last time, uh, just kind of saying goodbye to the Tropicana. Again, I, there are people who are going to be staying there uh, tonight for the last time. They're closing on a Tuesday at noon. Uh, just one of the, uh, you know, you know, last historical uh, hotels. Again, when you think about the uh, – the uh, you know the changes that have been happening in Las Vegas over the years. You know, I, I think most locals would agree not the best place to build a ballpark. And time will still tell if that happens. But yeah, I mean, just kind of a, a like a sad moment, I guess, when you look at uh, at the end of the run there for the uh, uh, trop. So I was glad that I got to stay there one last time. Got to uh, check out the bars and the restaurants and the say goodbye to some folks I had seen there like over the years. But um, listen, there's there's no doubt that Las Vegas would support a major league baseball team. Now the question is, you know, where's the best place to put that ballpark and all that stuff. And so like, like I don't know if everything's set in stone, but I, 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 I do think it's more likely than not that the Oakland A's will be in Las Vegas at some point.
One of the reasons we love having you on, Arash, in all seriousness, is because of your intrepid reporting. I mean, you go to the scene, <laughs> you put yourself in the trenches, in this case, the, the, the Tropicana, and one of the final nights uh, that it is open. I hope that they implode it just because I want to be there to watch it. I've never, right. uh, I, they, they don't do it as often as they used to. When I was yeah. out here as a kid, I never, uh, I've never got to take advantage. I blame my parents. My mom is in the casino right now, so I got to get on her after that about the show. Uh, but Arash Markazi of the Sporting Tribune, at Arash Markazi on social media, thanks so much for joining us. And, Safe travels. Have a great weekend in Phoenix for the Final Four. I appreciate you guys. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Appreciate you, Arash. And, yeah, love having him on. Love having r- reporters who are on the scene. There is something to be said in today's day and age about people that put themselves in those situations like Arash does. I can't believe it. Tonight is the final night, correct? That you can stay there. I'm going to go pull up taps on Spotify and... Uh, and play play the play the trumpets. Yeah, it was the last. <laughs> we didn't even get to NBA with him, by the way. Last time we talked a lot of Lakers and Clippers, but we'll have, we'll so have much plenty of to NBA. Talk we'll to. have plenty of NBA on the show tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be really really fun show tomorrow. I want to close out the show today? You said you had a couple of hockey plays that you were keeping an eye on. What do you like on the ice tonight? All right. Well, I'll just start off with the my favorite dog of the night is the Toronto Maple Leafs. Ooh. They are at home. You're getting plus money. They are playing the Florida Panthers, which we know how good the Florida Panthers are. But since they've clinched their playoff spot eh, they've kind of been slipping a little bit they've won two of their last nine Toronto the other way they've won four of their last six so I'm um, they also have double revenge the Panthers won the first two games between these two so I really think Toronto will be ready for this game tonight I like that plus 110 value there what about your biggest favorite that you're on tonight biggest favorite is probably the New York Rangers um against the Pittsburgh Penguins here um I like them tied up, though. I like them with Tampa Bay Lightning, who, as I just mentioned, Toronto hasn't clinched their playoff spot yet. Tampa Bay right behind them. They're in the one number one wild card spot right now, about four points behind Toronto. So they will be playing their best. And the Red Wings have not been good as of late. I believe they lost like, a, I don't know, seven of their last. Time. They've lost the a, They've lost a lot of games up here down the stretch. Yeah. So I like. The Lightning and the Rangers, those are both big favorites. Maybe tie those two together. Or if you can find a baseball favorite, if we could, uh, if there's anything you're looking at. I could find some. Is there any uh, any interest from you in the futures market in hockey as of right now? Do you have any futures bets? I don't have any. This is the first time in like three years that wow. I haven't had future at, at bets. This point, yep. At this point, grab the, the sheet with uh, Stanley Cup odds. Uh, right now, a, a trio of teams at 8-1, to one, rather four teams at 8-1 to one to win it all, right behind... The Golden Knights, who were uh, at least at the beginning of the year among among one of the best odds. This has been an, an interesting year in hockey with a lot of the injuries, a lot of these older teams playing a little bit slower than even they were expected to play. Um, if you were to place a futures bet right now, odds aside, we'll say, is, is there a team that you've got, Ryan, that you think is a really special run in, in store form? I really like Carolina. I would say the I would say the Canes and they've been right there for the last few years and I've been watching them. I also really like the Rangers, but I've had a future bet on them the last couple of years. I missed I missed the boat this year and they are just as good, if not better. Shisterkin actually hasn't been as good in net as he was last year, and that's what really got them here. It's been the whole team this year that's made the Rangers so special. But on the flip side, I hate saying this because it's our Vegas Golden Knights old coach, too, but the Dallas Stars, I like them from the Western Conference. Okay. Yeah. I don't hate it. And they have two really good goalies. So Ottinger, just like Shesterkin, one of the top last year, still coming into form again. It took him a little bit this year, but he's looking very good, and they have a great backup in Scott Wedgwood. Well, so always helps late, I think that's very important. It helps late in the season to have two goaltenders that's that you right. can go back and forth with, especially in a playoff series where, you know, if it goes seven games, you can trust one guy to go two, maybe even three games as a backup. That makes a huge, huge difference, as we've seen over the last handful of years. It really does. And um, the Rangers have that as well because they actually have, like, three good goalies now that they, they took quick, too. But it's hard. That Eastern Conference is very hard. We've got Wide the Rangers – the Panthers, I mean, we saw that run they went on last year, and they're even better than last year. Yeah. Boston's trying to, um, you know, undo this losing in the first round that they did last year, just like NBA, they're trying the, to get over that hump. They're the Purdue of the NHL. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are. Well, it was Toronto for a while, yeah. and then Toronto won the first round last year, and then Panthers took them out Interesting. after Tonight. the Panthers had beat Boston after they – had the most wins of the regular season. So we'll see. It's a lot of good teams. Still a little ways to go, but yeah, plenty of hockey talk. 
That'll just about wrap things up for today. Tell the viewers a couple of our guests for tomorrow because we have a guest late in program. Yes, we do. We have Steve Jones Jr. to talk NBA with us. And then we have um, sports betting analyst, professional sports better J.J. Uribe. We'll talk with him about Final Four women's basketball. And he's still in one of the contests, so we'll get his take on how he's kind of handling that. You know a thing or two about the contest in town. Yeah, we. so I think that's why we. Uh, he's been reaching out to me. I'm like, listen, you're you're still in. Take, you know, he's not trust yourself. You. Yeah. yeah, trust yourself. That's so we'll one get, of the most important things. I love talking to people that are in the contest about strategies because everyone's different. Everybody thinks that they're right. Only one or two people really can be right at the end of the day. So I'll be interested to see what JJ has. Yes. Also, Steve Jones Jr., former UNLV Run and Rebel player, former NBA assistant and does his podcast with JJ Reddick now. Always love getting his thoughts on the association. I've been seeing on Twitter, he's been posting about the NCAA tournament as well. So we'll get his thoughts uh, on some of these final four matchups as well. But Especially women, I think. Yeah, right? well, he's been all over the women. Yeah. So I'll be interested to get his thoughts on some of the games tonight. Again, uh, Iowa, LSU, last year's rematch. Getting going in about five minutes. Get your bets in now. And then at six, it's USC and UConn. It's going to be the most viewed night in women's basketball history at the collegiate level. Why don't you take part? I know we will be here. That wraps things up for us here on Sports by the Book. A big, big thank you to everybody behind the class. We got Jerry, we got Ann, we got the Drew Dog, we got my mom Babs visiting from Raleigh, North Carolina. And for my partner, Alex White, I'm Matt Nevert wrapping things up. Back at it tomorrow here on Sports by the Book. Same time, same place here from the South Book Studios. Until then, so long.